Welcome, we are Hot Garbage Incorporated. My name is Rob. Oh, wait. I'm Sumner. I'm Mia. I'm Jacob. Justin. And this is our team. Woo! Oh. <laughs> so, the problem that we are facing. There have been over 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic waste generated since 1950. Of that waste, more than half of it has been discarded into landfills and other uh, waste sites. 335 million metric tons of plastic waste have been generated in 2016 alone. We are uh, 91% of discarded waste goes to landfills or ends up as litter inside of oceans and the roads. Um, by 2050, we are predicted to have more mass of plastic in the ocean than of actual fish. And additionally, to make this topic even worse, China has recently ta uh, stopped taking a lot of U.S. scrap exports. So now where we used to just kind of ship this problem off to someone else to deal with, we have to deal with ourselves. Conventional secondary recycling is where you take plastic and you grind it down and remelt it and to create it into something new. So you use solely mechanical methods to uh, recycle it. But there are a lot of disadvantages for this process. First is that you need a good, clean <coughs> material. Any contaminants in there will spoil the entire batch. Second is that polymer deteriorates with every single cycle, so that when you recycle plastic with this method, you're not getting the same quality material back out. It's always worse. Now, again, this, because you're melting this material back down, this is only possible for thermomelt plastics. Any kind of thermal set is impossible to be recycled this way. And finally, is the concept of downcycling. While a lot of times people like to think that we recycle materials into something that's equivocally useful, it is oftentimes not. You take something that's actually useful, like say maybe a good water bottle, and break it down to some kind of knickknack instead of something that has actual value. Uh, <clears throat> pyrolysis is a potential answer to this recycling issue. Pyrolysis is where you apply heat to a material to have it decompose. Um, and if you do it right, you can take your plastic and break it back down into its monomers. There are, a lot of there are a lot of advantages to this process. First is that it opens up more plastics to recycling. Because instead of having to deal with just what can melt, you can just fit, uh, completely break it back down to its basic elements and bring it back up again. Remanufactured plastic, will, um, using this method, will be equally in performance to virgin plastic, because essentially it is virgin plastic that you recreate from clean monomer. <clears throat> we decrease our reliance on petroleum feedstocks, making this an ecologically friendly alternative. Um, and we also decrease the amount of plastics entering the waste streams because we divert it from that um, fate. Additionally, because uh, the economy then doesn't rely on foreign nations as much, the US economy overall is strengthened because of that. There are some disadvantages to this process. Uh, first is that it's more energy intensive. Instead of just melting their material down so that it's fluid and can be rejected, you actually have to break all those bonds down into, their, into these monomers. So it's more energy intensive. How, um, there's also a potential for byproducts. When you melt it, then you have no you know, chemical reactions, so it's the same material. But we have also some byproducts in this because you're making uh, and breaking chemical bonds. That in itself is a double-edged sword because sometimes these byproducts can have commercial or economic value in them of themselves. So if you think about it, right, currently we have petroleum feedstock, we manufacture our plastics, we use it and dispose of it. That's our current single use uh, paradigm. However, pyrolysis takes this and links it back to manufacture, allowing us to uh, avoid going to disposal and avoid more petroleum feedstocks and having a nice clean cycle. So the process that we were considering would be either to take pyrolysis through multiple stages or to do multiple pyrolysis systems. And while initially we wanted to take a uh, aggregate plastic waste and do various pyrolysis steps so that we can target different plastics with the monomers, we realized that this simply would not be good enough. We wouldn't have clean enough material, we wouldn't have clean enough product, and it would be too difficult to really make any sense of it. As a result, we decided instead to focus on a multi-step paradigm where we would take our, the plastic waste separate it and clean it into different uh, plastic types, and then have a targeted process for each one. All overall, we want to have something that we can then incorporate with existing US recycling methods. Now, there are a lot of par uh, plastics that we could have targeted for this. It's, we have many of them that we don't, that we don't realize, we just can't recycle. 
And there's polystyrene, which, all, which we all probably know about. That's um, food packaging, plastic utensils, and the like. There's PVC, which is used in a lot of building and water uses. There's polycarbonate, which is often used in a lot of construction and also for water, like a lot of water bottles are PVC or polycarbonate. There's ABS, which is used in electronics. And then finally, nylon, which is often used in textiles and fishing. In order to determine which of these plastics to target, we wanted to consider what is the recycling impact? Will we actually make a difference uh, if we develop a new recycling method for this process? Second is what are the products? We want a plastic that upon pyrolysis, we pr create primarily monomer prom product. Third is processability. If we process this product, we'll, uh, this plastic, will we actually destroy our equipment or will we actually be able to you know, have a long lasting system? And finally, availability. We want a plastic that we can actually access instead of something that's either too niche to be largely available or to um, you know, coated with other materials that makes it a bad choice. In the end, uh, we rank them from one to five, where one meaning that this completely does not fulfill this category and five being it is the ideal choice for this category. And we decided on polycarbonate as our plastic of choice. Polycarbonate, when we, oh, go on. Uh, when we break it down, um, it's this uh, bisphenol, a uh, BPA uh, monomer. So as you can see, it kind of cuts off this bond, it cuts off that bond, and we have BPA. Uh, BPE is another side product from this, which is a less used polycarbonate monomer. And then uh, for pyrolysis, we also obtain a lot of methylphenol and ethylphenol, which have their own uses in respective industries. All right, so um, now we have the problem formulation aspect of our um, presentation. So we based our system off data from a re, uh, study conducted by Antinoco and Achilles where we did a lot of process bench scale experiments with different types of catalysts and then they recorded the products based on mass. And from that data we selected silicolite as our catalyst because it yielded to the highest BPA and BPE. At the same time it produced no polyaromatic hydrocarbons which are known to cause cancer. So that's a plus in our safety aspect of it. And we assume any released carbons from the main polymer chains undergo complete react, complete combustion. So no carbon monoxide is formed and any coke or carbon buildup will not be accounted for. And <clears throat> byproducts of less than 0 0.5 mass percentage is absorbed by the closest related chemical species. Unidentified, the unidentified compounds from the data is absorbed by the closest um, related species and mo highest mass percentage. We added butanol, butanoic acid, pentanol, and pentanoic acid to help with the mass balance. And also, it, these are common compounds found in fuel production with pyrolysis. So our system, our process is actually divided into three phases, pre-treatment, which is pelletizing and washing the polycarbonate, reaction, which is the pyrolysis aspects of it, and separations is isolating our products. <clears throat> now, next we have here is the resulting reactor effluent, which is based on a four ton per day feed of polycarbonate. So our target is um, BPA, so that's 23.8%. Um, BPE is 2.5%. For ethylphenol is 6%. For methylphenol is 10 percent. So this is our initial process flow diagram. We wanted to utilize crystallization because there is literature support for high molecular weight separation using crystallizers and further purifications. And we want to target our other um, products using more um, traditional distillation column arrays. But upon doing all this, something. Sorry. Upon doing all this um, initial simulation, we got into some challenges. So the data we obtained from Antinoco and Culeus was based on a batch process. So what we're trying to simulate is a continuous process, so we needed to adapt this batch data into a continuous application. We also weren't able to obtain uh, solid and crystalline structures for BPA and BPE for the crystallizers using um, the effluent compounds mixed in with everything. So crystallizers were just out of the question from there on. But uh, the solution for at least the simulation aspects of our process, the reactor assembly um, will be 
made up of three parallel subassemblies to overcome the batch nature of data. And then our crystallizer will be substituted with inefficient distillation columns with 20, 30 plus trays. So that'll be really expensive. So this works as our worst case scenario. If we're able to achieve the, uh, the technical aspect of actually separating all our compounds, we can move on to the economics and see if it's fiscally feasible as well. Now, here's our final design process flow <coughs> diagram. As you can see here, um, around the reactor assembly, it's quite similar to our initial idea. So the, <coughs> so the pelleti pelletized polycarbonate travels into heat exchanger one, where it melts it down into a liquid to enter the reactor assembly. The effluent then travels out into heat exchanger two and goes into flash uh, separator one, where the heavier compounds travel down to distillation columns one and two to separate out BPE and BPA, and then the heavier compounds travel up to distillation columns three through six to separate out four, pheno, uh, four ethyl phenol and four methyl phenol. But if we zoom in into the PNID, we have, yeah, sorry, it's a little hard to see because we have a lot of stuff here, but in a, in a summary, it's basically we added some safety features, so pumps to, before each holding tank to make sure that we have a consistent flow of material going into each distillation column. And these holding tanks serve as a safety feature as well, just in case the distillation column breaks down, then those can hold the, con the chemicals um, that the previous one was holding. We, imp we implemented some level control, temperature control, and flow control around each um, heat exchanger as well. But if we zoom into the reactor assembly, as I mentioned before, we have three sub-reactors. Each one has their own temperature, flow and concentration control systems. The idea here is every, um, any, at any moment, two reactors will be operating during a 24 7 um, time, time frame. And they will alternate every three hours because that is the reaction time needed for the pyrolysis reaction. And every two weeks or so, one of these reactors will be switched out with the third one so that the, the one that's switched out can be cleaned and we can um, also re we can wash out the catalyst as well. Now we have um, the holding tanks where we implemented uh, level control, flow control, and pressure control. This again is just to make sure that we have consistent flow of material going to each distillation column and as this extra safety feature as well. But if we go into the next one, we have the P94 distillation column. So here is just a generic P90. So each distillation column will differ in diameter and tray number and all those other parameters. But the general idea for the controls are the same. We have your flow controls, level controls, temperature controls, and finally concentration controls to maintain a steady state for our system. So for our product stream summary, we were able to achieve reasonable purity and recovery for this process, with the worst being 76.8 for recovery and the worst for purity at uh, 91.2%. But um, our target was initially just BPA, but we got 99.9% .9 purity and 96.5, so that was successful in that portion. Uh, since this works as the worst case scenario and it achieves our technical goals, we can move on to the economic analysis and see if that's also feasible. Uh, but you can see here, we have room for improvement, especially for 4 methylphenol. We can do this by maybe tweaking some of the distillation column parameters, introducing more recycle streams, and more data on especially the crystallizers will definitely help with our process when we try to simulate crystallizers. So next we're going to talk about our safety considerations. Um, to ensure that we had all of the regulations necessary to uh, have a safe process run, we first had to take into account all the legislation for uh, running a chemical process such as this. And the first document we took into consideration was OSHA's um, Code of Federal Regulations 29, which basically sets out guidelines for running a process with very um, highly toxic and hazardous chemicals. Um, I don't know, this was mentioned before, but we don't have many highly reactive chemicals, but we do use chemicals that have risk associated with flammability and health risks. 
And so basically what this document says is that employers are required to uh, educate their employees about all of the hazardous qualities of their process and also to run a hazard analysis on all of the um, processes in their system. All data having to do with the chemical and physical um, pro properties of the chemicals, materials, and equipment they use should also be made available to the employees, as well as all the information regarding technology and the process limitations of equipment. It also asks that employers um, run tests on their equipment to make sure they're running up to stand, uh, standards and that they're pro um, operating functionally. Um, the TSCA requires that all manufacturers operate and, uh, not operate, that they, oh, sorry. It requires that all manufacturers um, run tests to make sure they know what the <coughs> hazards in their process are, and they um, send these tests to the EPA, so that way the EPA knows what's going on with their process, and this could have to do with the health and safety um, pro hazards in their process, or also with the risks associated with the man manufacturing and processing. The EPCRA has to do with um, industries communicating with their communities and local, federal, and state governments about all of the hazardous chemicals they're using, so that way communities can be more aware of how they can respond to um, different um, risks that may, may happen, like fires, explosions, and leaks. And this may mean getting in contact with different fire departments and other resources about how to handle evacuations or containment of these things. Um, sorry. Our industry, in order to make sure that we follow these guidelines, we would need to document and disperse all the information regarding the hazards in our process, and then also just come up with safeguards for the entire process and how we would combat different risks. So to make our process um, less risky and reduce the risk, we would have to change our process to make it more inherently safe. And the first thing we did to um, start doing that is change from one large reactor to two smaller ones. So as you mentioned before, we have three total reactors in our process. Two would be used somewhat continuously, and the third would be used when we're changing out catalysts or if there's something wrong with the first reactor. Um, and then we also have small holding tanks in between each process, which can hold up to an hour's worth of material. And these could be used to control the flow upstream or downstream if we have leaks or things we want to contain or if there's just a difference in flow in our, across our system. Um, as mentioned, we have flammable um, chemicals that we're using downstream. So we would decide to use welded pipe instead of flanged, and this would help contain fires if they do occur. But when fires occur, we also have UV and fire detectors which are used on units of concern. And these detectors would help operators tell where and when they have to deal with these fires. Um, so we decided to use a catalyst system in favor of no catalyst system for two reasons. The first is that a catalyst is helpful in preventing the creation of polyaromatic hydrocarbons which um, are health safety issues. And they also make it so we can operate at a lower temperature in our um, operation. We don't use any solvents in our process, which makes it inherently greener or more environmentally safe. And as you saw from before, we have a straightforward and detailed PNID. So operators, when there is an issue, they can see which instruments are connected to each other and how to better use valves to contain different problems. Um, so the next step in creating a system of safeguards for our system was creating multi-layer protection. And the first thing we did for this was do a chemical review based on our SDS of all the chemicals in our system to determine which ones provided the highest risk. Um, one of the bigger risks was the BPA, and that it rates a three on the NFPA diamond hazard scale. Um, so at room temperature, it is a solid, so we're not really concerned with cleaning it up if there is a spill. But there is a concern that it could be inhaled by workers downstream, so we would have them wear approved respirators and because BPE, we couldn't find any information on the NFPA scale, we decided that the workers working with BPE would also be using these respirators. Um, as for fires, we have valves to help control the spread of fires as well as CO2 and sprinklers to help extinguish them as they happen. And because we're using hermetically sealed um, pumps, we would have to ground all of our equipment to prevent the formation of sparks and also use NEMA type 7 explosive proof enclosures to help prevent these explosions from getting out of control. 
Um, we have two different plans of actions for spills and handling them. If they happen upstream before the reactor, we would just wait for the stream to cool and solidify before we clean it up because at this point it's only melted plastic that we're dealing with. But post the reactor, as you saw, we have a lot of different things coming out. So we'd have a concern with flammability and self, um, health safety, as I said before. So we'd have to actually um, evacuate the area and um, isolate whatever's spilling out. As for controls, we have a lot of different valves and temperature, pressure level, flow and concentration sensors that help us deal with the different disturbance variables in our process. And then if we do reach a point where we have um, detrimental effects on the product purity or just dangerous situations, we have critical alarms to alert um, the operators of what's going on so that way they can um, better react and contain whatever's happening. We also have relief discs, insulated uh, lines, and bypasses to help control the temperature and pressure fluctuations throughout our system, as well as grates and tanks to collect any leaks or any overflowing situations that may happen. If there are any critical failures, we also would have an emergency shutdown and evacuation procedure. So benzene, <coughs> methane, and n-butanol were our main concerns when it comes to flammability, but we intend to use um, the SDS information like the flashpoint, flammability, limit, um, flammability limits, and auto-ignition temperatures to help us predict when they might be causing big safety concerns and how to deal with that. And then finally, BPA, um, butyric acid, o cresol phenyl, and p cresol are our concerns when it comes to health. Um, so most of them are solid at room temperature, so again, we're not concerned with containing, mostly inhaling. And so again, we would be using those respirators by NIOSH uh, to help workers not breathe those in. And we would also use the appropriate PPE to make sure they're not coming in physical contact with them. And then for the butyric acid, because it's a liquid at room temperature, we would have to use, in addition to the normal PPE, um, chemically resistant gloves. So we performed an economic analysis to see if this was uh, fiscally feasible, um, which starts with our ISBL capital cost estimate, which we got from our uh, Aspen simulation cost estimation tool. And we supplemented this with um, uh, data on utilities and land cost of land in uh, Vermont. We decided to base our plant in Vermont, even though we, we could potentially implement this anywhere. Vermont was our best bet for a number of reasons, namely uh, low cost of land, it has very extensive waste plastic data, so we could get a more accurate look at our target um, feedstock quantity. And um, it's more dedicated than many states to environmental sustainability, so there's going to be more um, helpful legislature in place. Uh, for the OSBL cost, we took um, an estimate as 40% of the ISBL capital cost. We have a design and engineering cost, which is 10% of our ISBL cost estimate. Um, and finally, because these are class five uh, cost estimates, um, they typically have around 40% error. So to account for worst case scenario, we have a contingency cost, which is 40% of the combined ISBL and OSBL capital costs. So this brings our total uh, capital cost estimate for the plant to just over $17 million. For the production costs, um, the bulk of the production cost is just going to be labor and overhead, um, as the plant's going to be um, ideally running 24 hours a day. Our feedstock and raw material costs are kept pretty low, fortunately, because the feedstock is simply waste plastic. We can collect this from uh, municipal recycling centers around Vermont, and um, if we need more to reach our target um, feedstock of four tons per day, we can buy these from vendors around the country or overseas, um, which usually it only goes for about 10 cents per ton, um, so the costs remain pretty low. And then the only other raw materials are gonna be our catalyst and um, hydrogen peroxide. The silicolite catalyst um, can be washed out with the hydrogen peroxide, which causes it to be reactivated. Um, and so this allows us to reuse the catalyst for a lot longer, and we go through less of it, um, keeping our raw materials lower. Um, so for our revenue, it's going to come from the sale of these four products. Um, we're assuming that we are able to sell all of the products that we've generated, um, with the kind of exception of BPE, but I'll get to that. Um, the BPA price we got from a chemical trade magazine, ICIS, for their bulk price. It's the most current. Um, the 4-methylphenol and 4-ethylphenol uh, bulk prices were uh, estimated from a quote from uh, a chemical supplier, 001 Chemical. And then the BPE was a little more tricky to find an accurate estimate of revenue. Um, all the prices found online are in very small quantities and extremely high cost. 
So if you were to scale this up to the kilogram scale, it would be thousands of dollars per kilogram. Um, so to account for a lower demand for BPE, seeing as it's not um, very, it's not very widespread, um, we estimated the price at a fraction of what it normally is found. To account for maybe we wouldn't be able to sell it all, um, or if we were, it'd be at very decreased cost. So this brings our total revenue to just under five million dollars per year. Uh, this is kind of just a summary of the cash flows of the first six years of operation. Um, it's based on a 5% um, interest rate on the initial loan of the capital cost. And then the after-tax cash flow each year just goes to paying off the principal on the loan. Um, and this allows us to pay off the entire plant in around 16 years of operation. Um, it should be noted that 5% is definitely a low interest rate for a new business startup. Many venture capitalists will seek for interest rates around like 20%. Uh, but we should keep in mind that this is like absolute worst case scenario with a full contingency cost estimate. Um, we're using, this is with our Aspen simulation using highly inefficient distillation columns instead of more optimized uh, crystallizers. And then furthermore, we can apply for um, grants from the EPA, such as the uh, source assistance, source reduction assistance, or solid waste management grant that would further bring down our initial capital cost and uh, increase our return on investment. Um, when filing our business structure, we would like to file our business as a benefit corporation and obtain certified B Corp status. A benefit corporation um, is a federally defined entity, and um, the definition of that is a for-profit entity that includes positive impact on society, employees, and the environment in its legally defined goals. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to consider factors other than the highest purchase offer at the time of sale. So basically what this does is it allows us to consider things like economic feasibility, but also at the same scale, um, the renewability and to make decisions based on um, the welfare of people and also the environment. We would also like to obtain B Corp status, which is um, certified by a nonprofit called B Labs. And what that does is they send in their auditors, they send in their accountants, and that verifies that a company meets sustainability and environmental performance standards. And so this creates value for non shareholding stakeholders. And it basically ensures that even though you know, we're in this profit game um, to recycle things, we're also looking to um, better the world through it. And when talking about companies, we also want to mention our competitors as well. And I want to say that we have a huge advantage over our competitors, which is that recycled is a value added term. That means that we have a higher value product. That means that people that buy from us can upcharge their stuff if they want um, because they use a clean green source. Um, our Small scale operations is limited by raw material availability. And even though we have five huge companies here that all produced over 100,000 tons per year, we are also producing around 300,000 tons, 300,000, 300 tons, 300 tons, 300 tons, 300 tons, 300 tons per year. But that's uh, no, nothing to sneeze at because we'd be able to fulfill the demands of smaller scale and mid scale companies that are looking for our product. And so our customers, um, we want to target polycarbonate manufacturers that don't already make BPA themselves. Since, as Sumner said, we'd be selling our stuff at cost, there's literally no reason not to buy from us because we're providing a clean green source that they can say that um, it comes from a renewable source um, and it's the same price that they'd be buying from. Um, through some extensive market research, we've determined that our four main products do have potential customers out there. Um, so our BPA can be used as polycarbonate feedstock to potential companies such as Revago <coughs> Manufacturing America. BPE can be used as a potential drug, drug application to many biotechs, including Cell. Methylphenol is also used um, both as a fragrance chemical and also the antioxidant BHT. So there are a wide variety of ways that this can be purchased and used. And ethyl phenol is also used as a fragrance chemical. So combined with the one above, there are companies like International Flavors, Fragrances, and Simrise that are looking to purchase this as well. So all in all, since China decided to stop letting us export our waste to either landfills or to burn, um, this waste is really too expensive to discard in other places and not useful with traditional recycling. Um, after some meetings with uh, one of New England's largest recycling centers, uh, we've determined that polycarbonate is a high volume and also non-recycled material. So we wanted to find a solution for dealing with that plastic waste that is currently today ending up in our landfills and the oceans and other places that it shouldn't be. So we were able to show that polycarbonate recycling is feasible via pyrolysis, both technologically and fiscally. And at the worst case scenario, we'd be turning a profit um, with a 5% IRR over a 16-year period. 
But this is a unique product. It's the only recycled monomer manufacturer on the market today. And we're also hoping that this will spur some changes um, in not only manufacturers, but also recycling centers so that we can continue to make this world a more feasible place to live in. Thank you. So uh, your process produces a bunch of organic materials, and your, your business plan is to sell four major ones, isolate them, purify, and sell them. What happens to all the other organics that are produced in the process? So currently, the rest of the four um, in the process are slated technically as waste. However, these are all organic hydrocarbons, so either we can sell them as fuel, uh, which we didn't necessarily consider at this time, or more likely, we can use it to fuel our reactors so that there's absolutely no side, like side products whatsoever besides the four that we're interested in. Sounds good to me. <laughs> That'll lower our heat and utility cost as well. <laughs> burn our own stuff, yeah. So using them as fuels, those are probably our, those are our main <coughs> compounds. Sorry? You're generating mostly aromatic compounds, right? Yes, um, there are some small percentage of benzenes and others. As you saw with the uh, polycarbonate, it's two, high, um, two aromatics connected by a link and then a carboxyl group. Yeah. So those are not high energy compounds. They're, it's, not, it's, like, it's not like hydrocarbons. And usually oh. people try to stay away from aromatic, aromatic you know, right. the rate in their fuels. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would burn for sure. Exactly. But it's not going to be the most efficient. Uh, burning. Um, I have a question about uh, polycarbonate in particular. Uh, so uh, you generate also a gas when you get it depolarized, uh, don't you? Yes. So the way is a our catalyst is a zeolite catalyst. So it works by an acidic mechanism. The idea is that when you had the um, so you have the two. Um, yeah, uh, okay. so you have the two rings. You have the two rings, right? You have the chain middle, and there's a two carbons on the side. So that's that that group is fairly stable. The um, the zeolite is targeting the uh, proton accepting group on the sides of the carbonate groups. So the idea is that yes, that um, it attacks that, it breaks the uh, C um, C double O group, and sends that off, and that's the CO two that we generate. So that's why we had a large percentage of CO two being generated in this process. Yes. So well, if you get, go back to your process. Uh, how do you capture that CO2? How do you deal with the, the pressure buildup in your reactors? Uh, the pressure buildup is sent. Uh, well, the idea is that it would go off into the um, the flash separator first, where it gets separated off in the top um, there. So the idea is that it would be all contained. Um, Pressure-wise, work with these guys. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. take the CO2. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Together. Yeah. Um, Pressure-wise, we are. Because for every PPA molecule, generate one CO2 molecule. Yeah. So that that is a lot of pressure. Uh, in terms of the reactors themselves, we did spec them out so that they would be able to handle those higher pressures, and then, as um, in our simulation, that that was accounted for throughout the the flow of the pipes and everything. So. System wise, it it's, it's an, uh, so you're going to use what catalyst did you say? Is it's uh, silver light, which is a medium poor. Sorry. Yeah. Silver light is a medium poor zeolite catalyst. So, zeolite catalyst? Yes. And did you look into the regeneration process for the catalyst, what that requires in terms of chemicals and time? Yeah. yeah, it's basically just a hydrogen peroxide wash. The catalyst loses its activity just by having like the pores clogged with material. So for the most part, you can just wash it out with hydrogen peroxide. It'll restore its activity. Um, we still accounted to replace it after every, I think it was like bi-monthly or something. Um, so it's a solid catalyst. Yeah. Yes. And so, and how are you running the polymer into that solid? Are you dissolving into solvent or? The polymer well, is going to be, well, it's going to be. Polycarbonate, right? Yes. Yeah. So how do you get it to react with your solid with solid? So it, oh, uh, it enters as a liquid yeah. Yeah, with our heat exchanger. So, so we first palletize it, clean it, it goes in the... Uh, uh, you're going too fast for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat what you said? So it comes in as a solid after we pre-treat it by cleaning it, palletizing it, and then it enters the heat exchanger one where we use um, hot steam. And then it, and then it, um, it melts down the... <laughs> 
polycarbonate, and then it enters the, the system. It enters as a, as, a, as a liquid. As a liquid, yes. At what temperature is that? I think it was around 450. 450. 450. Yeah. Well, well, the reaction happens at 450. You know, I, I bet you that at 450, you may be able to, to expel the CO, and you don't even need a catalyst to this reaction. Technically, yes, but we found that safety-wise and our uh, in interest of our products, silicolite was better performing in that aspect. It's more selective towards is that. There, is there any, did you find any papers on that? Or? Yes, yeah. so there was... Oh, you don't have to tell, I mean, you don't have to show me, just tell me. Yeah, yeah there, there was, um, it's a fairly, um, it's like a very really not a new field in terms of this concept, especially because um, the whole recycling thing, you should be, it's always cheaper to send it out until <coughs> now. Uh, but there are papers on this that have been testing a variety of potential catalysts, not only zeolites, but other um, silicon-based catalysts. And then I believe there were a couple oxide-based catalysts. But from uh, we listed a paper in this that we specifically took this one from because it had the best modern yield. Just so you know, most carbonates or polycarbonates tend to break down at high temperature. So it's like a... Uh, you mentioned the pyrolysis in, at some point. Was it, was it at the beginning? Yep, yeah, that's the um, that's a, the reactor assembly right at the yeah. first step there. Yeah. So, um, so pyrolysis uh, pyrolysis normally is burning when you burn your uh, in the presence of oxygen. It, that's my definition. This is the definition that I know of pyrolysis. Okay. Do you in know, the presence do you know or different pyrolysis? Without the presence of oxygen. Yes. Um, the definition that I've been exposed to in industry is that burning is with oxygen. Pyrolysis is the decomposition of material in the presence of high heat and no oxygen. In the presence of? No, of high heat and no oxygen. No oxygen. So okay. we're, we're technically doing a catalytic pyrolysis, which is yeah. also a uh, catalyst in there, but no oxygen. Okay, so no, no oxygen. Fuel. Okay. So you want to your your heating unit. So under those conditions, normally your polycarbonate should break down yeah. without any catalyst. Just right. That that you can you can expect that to happen. Um, which leads me to really the design of your system. What is your catalyst bed here? Where do you put the catalyst? In the uh, reactor assembly. Oh, so yeah. next, That's next where the catalyst is sitting. Yes. Yeah. So, so your liquid actually passes through the catalyst. Yes. Oh, true. And and so, the catalyst is pelleted. Is it powder? Is it a? Uh, is it a? Uh, um, is it, it a column or how is it? Uh, it, w it would have to be pelletized. Um, if it was powder, it would come right back out with their material, because it would be fairly viscous. Okay. So it would pellize, um, you would flow it through, the idea being that the, cat, the plastic would be able to enter through the pores, it would break, the acidity would break specifically at the more proton accepting group, which is that carb carbonate group. Um, and because of that, it will be less likely to attack the um, that methyl bridge between the two uh, hydrocar the uh, benzene chains, benzene rings. So uh, we, we have seen, there. Um, our initial plans were to go with straight pyrolysis because literature does suggest that um, does show that it does break at those temperatures but it is not selective as it is with the catalyst itself all right and another question I have for you at, uh, at the end of the process when you collect those smaller molecules uh, and you have distillation columns going on there it, it's some, I, I can't, Here? six distillation yes. columns going on there yes. yeah. so what are you distilling there? Uh, so this is 4-methylphenol and 4-ethylphenol for the lighter compounds that we're interested in. What's the boiling point of this compound? Boiling point, it was... Um, it's around like 35 degrees Celsius. How much? Three, oh no, 35 is melting point. Yeah. Boiling point is pretty high. high. It's, it's pretty high. Yeah. Um, it's as, high. We, as we've said in the start of the presentation, uh, we were having issues with aspen and the crystal. We want. We were initially planning on using crystallization for that because it makes sense. Instead of adding heat into it to have it evaporate and go out, we just slowly take. If we have a slow controlled removal of heat, we can crystallize it out and have very high purity yields. However, aspen doesn't play nice if you don't have that crystallization data. So for that reason, we have to go with distillation just to make our proof of concept work. Um, because it works and it's physically, it's uh, economically feasible with our really 
inefficient distillation method where you have to keep pumping heat in. If it works here economically, it means that crystallization wise, it should be far more economically efficient. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions?